we can start uh, on the next page, which is about the concept of fascism. Now, here is a flag you've probably never seen. That's the fascist flag. Usually, in this position, you will be offered another flag, the Nazi flag, with the uh, swastika in it. Well, that's not a fascist flag. Uh, and it's a, it's a simple symbol of how Nazism and fascism are two different things. Uh, so to start with fascism. Uh, so the fascism was named after the Fasces. The Fasces is a Roman uh, symbol of the Roman Republic, even not of the Roman Empire. Uh, and it signified the authority of the lictor. The lictor was the minister for public order, so the chief of police. And um, it consisted of an axe uh, surrounded by a bundle of uh, twigs. Uh, this uh, symbol is still used, so unlike the swastika, which has become taboo in the West. The Fasces is still an acceptable symbol. It's still the symbol of the Swiss province of St. Gallen, which during the war, in order to avoid confusion, added the cross of the Swiss flag to this design in order to make sure that nobody would confuse it with the then uh, popular uh, fascist flag. Anyway, so the um, the operative word here is fasces, or in Italian at the time fascio, and so that meant a bundle. That is to say, a number of items seeking each other's strength, supporting each other. Uh, so it's a union, and particularly a trade union. And so it was a symbol of trade unionism. You see, if the workers are just individuals, then the employer can do with them more or less what he wants. But if they band together, they are strong. You know, as an English, uh, a British song says, you don't get me, I'm part of the union. You don't get me, I'm part of the union. Well, that's the idea. So the uh, man who um, made uh, fascism uh, was a trade unionist, namely Benito Mussolini. He was a socialist. He was from a leftist family. In fact, his first name was given to him in a reminiscence of a Mexican revolutionary, Benito Juarez. Uh, he was a leftist from, from the cradle. And so this notion of fascism was a leftist notion par excellence, namely of the trade union. Now, in 1914, the um, one of the great disappointments of Marxist theory took place. You see, one thing was that in economic respect, this um, the predictions of Karl Marx were not entirely coming true. There was no verelendung, no immiserization of the working class. On the contrary, in spite of regular economic crises, prosperity gradually increased. Also, the advances in technology, well, were of benefit to everyone. So um, here, another thing happened, which was also a, a big blow to Marxist predictions. Namely, they had expected that the working class would stay united when the bourgeoisie was concocting a war. But it turned out that in the European parliaments, when the uh, war budget had to be voted, that the socialist parties joined in, certainly gave no effective resistance and mostly effectively voted for them. So the working class, rather than being in solidarity with all the foreign workers, were in solidarity with their own national bourgeoisie. So 
Mussolini took the conclusion of making a shift from Marxist internationalism to nationalism because he said, you know, this is a, this is a democratic decision because the people themselves have shown that they have a national feeling that overrules their internationalist ideals. So what is fascism? Uh, there are a number of uh, different definitions and um, I'll take a few. Stanley Payne is one researcher who defines fascism in terms of three negations. He says that uh, fascists are anti-liberal, anti-communist, and anti-conservative. That's interesting. So they um, reject liberalism as it existed at the time, mainly in the form of what Marxists call bourgeois democracy. So Marxists don't believe in democracy, uh, saying that, well, you see, the real power is not in those parliaments. Those parliaments are a, a make-believe, a tamasha, and um, real power is elsewhere. But liberals, by contrast, believe that parliaments are really where the power is. And so in the interbellum, people tended to have a diminishing belief in democracy. You see, the democracies, incidentally, were not very credible because at the time they were the centers of colonial empires that didn't function very democratically. Uh, but moreover, you see, democracy was in crisis at the time, or those states were in crisis, especially economically. Then there was also a crisis because many social equations changed after the First World War. And it was felt that the democracies as such had no good answer. So by the 1930s, it was very normal to take a public stand against democracy. Like, and, and, and this was outside the movements that we are now considering. Like, for example, the King of Belgium, um, Leopold III, publicly said that he believed in a strong regime, that he himself would like to take more powers that at that time rested with parliament. So it seemed that at that time, the non-democratic states, by that time there was also Nazi Germany, but also fascist Italy, and also the Soviet Union, you see those three were seen together, uh, were more successful, especially in development. You see, this was certainly visible in Germany, which was the most modern state at the time. And it was also visible in the Soviet Union in the sense that it was developing industrially. So uh, this less so in Italy. Nevertheless, Italy shared in this aura of success, contrasting with the crisis, especially very visible at the time since 1929, the economic crisis in all the Western powers, also in, in the United States. And so at the time, it was perfectly feasible to take a stand against democracy. Uh, if the Hindutva movement had wanted to say, one of our goals is to abolish democracy, for what much democracy there already existed in India, they perfectly could have gotten away with that. Because it was the, it was the done thing at the time. Then anti-communism. Yes, um, so the issue of nationalism versus internationalism played a uh, major role. Then something that also played, but this is a bit of a complex issue, is the fact that anti-communism or that communism uh, was anti-religion and that religion was very actively suppressed in the Soviet Union. And so... Uh, both Mussolini and Hitler were post-Christians, or Mussolini not even post-Christian, he was not from a Christian uh, family, but so they were from Christian societies, but themselves had become post-Christian. 
In fact, you see there, goodbye to the church is something that in Europe, of course, hundreds of millions since then have gone through, myself included. But so while nothing special, nothing specific, it is important to understand their position. You see, they were not personally religious. Nevertheless, they didn't think of suppressing religion. And so you could perfectly be a Catholic or a Protestant in uh, Italy or in Germany, uh, with the exception of religious, well, eccentric uh, sects, as they call them, cults, because in Germany those were forbidden, like neo-paganism was forbidden in Germany, contrary to a widespread opinion. And, and so that was a, a very important issue for the population in general. That's why many people, even though they were not active fascists, nevertheless condoned fascism because it was militantly anti-communist. And so uh, there were many street fights between fascist militias and communist militias. And so that's something that people saw that was reported in the newspapers and so on. And so in those fights, their sympathy was with the fascists. So it had a wide support base. Then anti-conservatism. You see, this is the surprising element. The narrative about political ideologies is controlled by the left. And so the left spreads the story that you have a certain rightward movement. And so towards the right, first you have like the, the bourgeois, free market people. Then you have the articulate conservatives. And then you have the far right ending in fascism. Now, that's not an accurate description of where you can put fascism. Fascism was anti-conservative. One thing by which you can see it immediately is that they um, had young leaders. The leaders of the fascist parties, not just those that came into power, but also the oppositionalist fascist movements or related movements that existed, that flourished in Europe, in, in all the European countries at that time, had young leaders, young dynamic personalities. And so they saw the old system as something decadent, as something to, to get free from. And so they believe in youth, like the, the song uh, of the fascist party in Italy was called Giovinezza, which means youth you know, being young, which incidentally provides a great contrast with the RSS movement in India, which is a gerontocratic movement. So, uh, fascist goals, according to Stanley Payne, include the creation of a nationalist dictatorship to regulate economic structure, to transform social relations within a modern self-determined culture. See, anti-conservative, a modern culture, and the expansion of the nation into an empire. Now, about that, well, that doesn't count for every movement of this kind in uh, that time. Like, for instance, in my country, there was a movement called the Verdi Naso, the Vereniging van Dietse Nationaal uh, Solidaristen. Let me correct myself. So the uh, the union of Theudic, that is to say, Netherlandic uh, national solidarists. You see, often people who haven't studied it properly think that the uh, abbreviation refers to NASO, national socialist. That's not the case at all. It means national solidarist. And solidarism was a name given to the then um, ideology or, or social doctrine taught by the Catholic Church. And so that was based on, uh, well, what they call corporatism. That is to say, society is like a body. You see, here you have the image that you also find in the Purusha Sukta of the Rigveda. 
uh, where society is compared to a body. Now that imagery uh, is not typically Hindu, is not typically Vedic. Uh, it existed, for example, in the Roman Empire or in the Roman Republic, where Menenius Agrippa made that same comparison when there was a class conflict in Roman society. He himself told the, uh, the leaders of the popular classes, uh, well, you see, if the uh, lesser organs in the human body, the ordinary organs, the stomach, the feet, and so on, if they start saying, no, I want to be the brain, well, you know, then things will become difficult. You know, the brain cells need the feet cells and vice versa. You know, all of them are necessary for one another and for themselves. So that's the harmony model. And so against the Marxist model of class struggle, they pose the harmony model. Now you see that association, the Verdinazo, they were nationalists and they believed in the uh, reunification of Belgium and the Netherlands into the, 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 the country that existed in about 1820 when it was united. And they also wanted to bring the colonies together. So the Netherlands had Indonesia and Belgium had the Congo. And so they wanted, they dreamed of an empire uh, where Belgium and Netherlands were united together with Indonesia and the Congo. Um, but you see, so you, you can call that, especially in the, in the post-colonial uh, view, you can certainly call that imperialist. Nevertheless, it was not imperialist in the sense that they wanted to conquer anything. You see, they simply believed, okay, God has given us this, now it's like that. But they were satisfied with this. And that's the case for quite a few nationalisms. Uh, the case of uh, Nazi Germany, of Japan, and here also of Italy is different because they actively aspired to conquest. The Germans wanted to conquer their Lebensraum, their living space, which meant effectively Poland, Ukraine, parts of Russia that had been given to Germany in the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk in 1918, when the Germans had won the war on the Eastern Front whereas on the Western Front, the war was still going on and they would lose it. Uh, but so that part was uh, had been German for a very brief period. And that's what Hitler thought of when he wanted to restore this so-called living space. Italy would uh, colonize Ethiopia in 1936. And then when the war started, it also tried to conquer Albania and Greece. And, and of course, you can argue that this is not nationalism. Most nationalists today will say, okay, nationalism is not patriotism. And here this doesn't mean, oh, patriotism, good, nationalism, evil. No, it means just the reverse. Or, you know, patriotism means serving the interests of your own country regardless of the interests of other countries. So this may include conquest of somebody else's territories. You know, when that serves the interest of your own country, then to hell with the national interests of this other country. Whereas nationalists will say, no, you see, we believe that every nation has a right to live in its own state. So nationalism there does not mean imperialism and is in fact the great enemy of imperialism. The way that in India, the uh, freedom movement called itself nationalist as opposed to British imperialism. You see that the imperial project, the colonial project of Britain is rarely described as nationalist. You know, I mean, you can argue, of course, this, this was meant to serve British interests, but still, you don't call it, it's not normally called nationalist. And so uh, this makes sense because nationalism in the true sense does not mean imperialism. Now, in the case of fascist Italy, it did mean imperialism. 
Porto, uh, Mussolini thought of restoring the Roman Empire. And they celebrated in a big way the um, anniversary of the Emperor August. You see the one of the, the high points of the Roman Empire. Um, and so when Ethiopia was conquered, he told the Italians on the radio, okay, people, here is your empire. So there you have the expansion of the nation into an empire. Um, then fascist style. Um, the Italian fascists were into modern art. Um, this is also much less known. And it's a big difference with uh, Nazism. You see, in Germany, art was rather conservative. They frowned on modern art. Uh, Italy, by contrast, was into modernity, especially in the arts. At the same time, one uh, word I see there that ought to catch your attention is the promotion of masculinity. You see, um, fascism was always seen as a men's affair, and it contrasted with the effeminate aspect of democracy. In democracy, you know, it's not action that is central, it's all this palaver, all this uh, endless talk, you know, like women do, all these parliaments, they, uh, they don't come to action. In fact, that's an idea which is now again rather popular in China at the moment. You have this rhetoric of, you see, Western democracy is uh, undecisive. It doesn't go anywhere. Look at the immobilism that you see in Europe. It also creates internal divisions, like look what you see at the moment in the United States. Uh, so by contrast, uh, a strong regime is far more capable of action. So that, that was the idea at the time. Next, some more definitions. Uh, there is Nick Griffin. I don't think I would have mentioned him if I hadn't seen him regularly on Twitter lately, where he defended the Muslim side regarding the Leicester riots where he denied that uh, Hindus had been attacked and that their own wailing of victimhood was only a tactic that really prepared for their aggression against Muslims and so on. So it's typical for what the left in the West does nowadays. Now, he reduces fascism to a palingenetic form of populist ultranationalism. Uh, so in his case, nationalism is not enough. He says ultra-nationalism. Now, the word populist is interesting. It is a fact that um, this was a populist movement in the sense that it was a movement from the ground up. It was a movement of the working class. Uh, in Germany, too, the German leadership of the Second World War was contrasted as populist or uh, vulgar compared to the aristocratic German leadership of the First World War. Um, you have to be careful, though, with the word populist. If leftists in the West nowadays use the word populist, they usually mean democracy. When they want to lambast popular votes, like in the Brexit, for example, um, then they call it populist. The populist in their mouth is usually a synonym for democracy. Uh, this palingenetic thing means to make something happen again, to bring the past back. We'll devote some attention to this at the end. Now, interesting in his definition is that a second pillar of fascism that's absolutely elementary is missing, namely the fact that fascism is against democracy. Uh, now this, this, you know, again has to do not so much with the reality of fascism, 
but more with the eye of the beholder of Nick Griffin and most of the leftist uh, intellectuals today, um, they don't like the idea of democracy anymore because the people vote wrongly. You know, they see a, a rise of rightist parties in the elections, like now in Sweden and in Italy. They want to keep the people down. Or like in the, the case of the Brexit, you see where the people cast the wrong vote. They made the wrong choice. Uh, so they don't like democracy much anymore. And so in his case, it has gone that far that even in describing fascism, he overlooks the anti-democratic element. Another scholar, Jason Stanley, defines fascism as a cult of the leader who promises national restoration in the face of humiliation brought on by supposed communists, Marxists, and minorities and immigrants who are supposedly posing a threat to the character and the history of a nation. In the case of Italy, we have this uh, inebriated talk about restoring the Roman Empire, going back to the past. That element was indeed there. National restoration in the face of humiliation, that's not so much an issue in Italy. That was an issue in uh, Germany. But as we shall see, uh, people who use the term fascist often mean more than fascism, often mean all the nationalist authoritarian movements, including Nazism, and everybody has forgotten about all the others. Who knows about the Arrow Cross movement from Hungary, to name one, uh, or the Verdinazo from Belgium, uh, no, but everybody knows about Nazism. And so what they mean is Nazism. And that was indeed a reaction to the national humiliation that was imposed on Germany after the First World War. In Wikipedia, uh, in the entry fascism, fascism is defined as a far-right movement and then all kinds of specifics, but it is called far-right. Now, that's not so obvious. This is Robert Eatwell here, who defines fascism as an ideology that strives to forge national rebirth based on a holistic, national, radical third way. You see, fascism is defined as neither left nor right, and that's how it defines itself. You see, that's a, a very common phrase. And uh, there is a, an Israeli scholar, J.F. Sternhell, who actually wrote a book about uh, fascism titled Neither Left Nor Right. So they saw themselves as neither left nor right because they were anti-conservative. They saw conservatives as the right. You know, at that time, it still had a strong sociological meaning, the aristocracy. In many countries, this was still very important. There was a monarchy in many more countries than, than survived till today. So they saw themselves as neither left nor right, as a third way. Now, is there a link between the Hindu movement and fascism? In 1931, B.S. Munje, who was the president of the Hindu Mahasabha, uh, visited Italy. And he um, took a tour of its youth militia, the Bali Lamu. And in his diary, he praises what he saw. He praises this military preparedness. And that he wants to introduce in India. And effectively, sometime later, he founded a military academy in Nasik. But nothing else. He doesn't say, oh, you see, the fascist system is the model that India should follow. Even when he's, you know, wined and dined by the fascists, still he doesn't take that step. Anyway, whatever he did was too late to decide on the orientation of the Hindu movement, which was created earlier. 
Uh, the RSS organization was created in 1925. The Hindu Mahasabha itself was founded in 1922. Here I haven't distinguished between those two. But um, at any rate, they already existed and they had their inspiration from elsewhere. There was a pro-Italy society in Maharashtra. I'll have to look up the name. I, I didn't fill that in. Anyway, the point I wanted to make is that as soon as the Second World War started, they broke off the relation because that is what they saw starting to happen was not what they had in mind, was not what they wanted. It must be said, however, until 1938, when uh, fascist Italy ganged up with Nazi Germany, uh, and largely even until 1940, when the war started in right earnest, to link openly with fascist Italy would have been perfectly feasible, would not have been a scandal, because at that time Italy was still one country among many, did not stand apart. Like, for instance, Winston Churchill praised Benito Mussolini. Uh, this is an interesting story in itself. Indians mostly know Churchill as a terrible racist. Over here in Belgium, we see Churchill as the great liberator from the Nazi occupation, the man who stood against Nazism when nobody else did. In India, they see him mostly as the man who condoned the uh, Bengal famine and who spoke very, very disparagingly about uh, India, you know, a beastly people with a beastly religion. Uh, anyway, I be that as it may, you see, he sympathized with Benito Mussolini. And the reason for that is rather racist. You see, he considered the Italians like an inferior people, as big children, you know, emotional and so on. And so not capable of governing themselves. You see, in the case of Germany, the fact that they had rejected democracy was reprehensible. Because they were grown-ups like the British, they were capable of governing themselves. But Italians, no. And so what he thought about Italians gives you an idea of what he thought about Indians. You see, Italians needed the strong leader. Indians needed the British. But at any rate, they needed somebody to look over them and, you know, like children in, his, in a, the playground in school. They need to be supervised. So in that sense, he supported Benito Mussolini. He didn't think that for all mankind, democracy is the right form. You may also like to know a little uh, snippet of knowledge that uh, Subhash Chandra Bose traveled on an Italian passport. You see, he didn't look exactly like a European to make him pass as European. He was given a false identity as a nobleman from Sicilia, the southernmost part of Italy, where people are a bit darker and so on. So he could pass as a Sicilian nobleman. And so it uh, deserves to be mentioned here that against this uh, pro-Italian tendency, Savarkar supported the British Savarkar, the then uh, president of the Hindu Mahasabha in 1931, only a few days after the outbreak of the Second World War, he committed the, uh, the influence he had to the British war effort. And so he called on the Hindu youth to take service in the British Indian Army, which millions did. Like, for instance, in the... Um, the uh, murder conspiracy against Mahatma Gandhi by activists from the Hindu Mahasabha. Three out of seven were veterans from the British Indian Army. This is never mentioned, you see. There are so many books and papers that argue for the fascist nature of Hindu Dwa. And so inconvenient facts like this one are often left out. Now, it's not that Savarkar was such a great supporter of Britain, but um, 
you know, it was just instrumental, he thought, in the circumstances that gaining military experience would strengthen the Hindu nation and would, after the war, quickly lead to India's freedom. So um, for him, Indian freedom was supreme. He was not for the Axis or against the Axis. He was mostly for India. Now, if uh, people speak about fascism nowadays, what they mostly mean is Nazism, National Socialism. You see, fascism in itself was not really very memorable. You know, at the time, it, it, it ought to be noticed as an important political movement. Today, it would hardly be remembered. Uh, very many people today would not know who Benito Mussolini was. It was a fairly ordinary dictatorship. Yes, it conquered a few countries also, but then this has happened numerous times in history by all kinds of regimes. It didn't commit any genocide. It didn't persecute the Jews, though when Germany uh, conquered northern Italy, then the persecution started. Uh, militarily, it was not very successful, and it had no racial ideology. You know, it taught people to be members of the state, but what race was not so important. In fact, it took the example of the Roman Empire where all kinds of people were integrated, where dark people could easily become Roman citizens and have all the rights that all Roman citizens enjoyed. So fascism was not so special, but when they say fascism, they don't mean fascism usually, they mean a far more grim ideology, namely National Socialism. This is, for instance, what happens in Wikipedia. You know, you read the uh, article about fascism and much of it is about National Socialism. You will probably have been surprised by the flag on the first page uh because mostly you would expect a swastika flag and hardly anyone knows the the fascist flag so um the reason for all this uh, or the cause of all this is that joseph stalin the leader of the world socialist movement forbade the tainting of the term socialism by referring to the enemy as national socialism and so instead they uh, had to use the term fascism yet you see at the time everybody knew the difference national socialism and fascism were very different movements and uh, many people outside those countries uh, supported fascism all while opposing National Socialism. Like for instance, this was the case of uh, Georges Dumézil, a French scholar whose name you will meet if you study uh, Indo-European. Or for instance, in Belgium, there was a, a movement called the Légion Nationale, the National Legion, which was pro-fascist and which started a resistance when Belgium was occupied by the Nazis. Like uh, a friend of mine, his uh, father was a resistor in the Légion Nationale. He was a rightist, but he was an anti-Nazi. And so he was arrested by the Nazis and he spent most of the war in Buchenwald concentration camp. Uh, so you have all kinds of uh, different uh, versions within this nationalist camp. Now, how did Hindus like National Socialism? Well, they didn't have much of an opinion on National Socialism, which very, very, very few people knew what it was all about. But, you see, politics is often very personalized, and certainly in India. And so it must be conceded that Hindus had a certain affection for the person of Adolf Hitler. You see, if this German regime had been 
ruled by Himmler or Goebbels or one of the other big wigs, that would not have made such an impression in India. But Hitler was something special. Um, it has to be considered, first of all, in general, that Hitler was one of the most popular uh, personalities in history worldwide. You see, he was very popular among Muslims, mostly for the anti-Jewish reason. He was very popular in Latin America. He and also Mussolini, like uh, Fidel Castro, the communist uh, dictator of Cuba. When he was a young fellow, he would imitate Mussolini's rhetoric in front of the mirror. Or Allende, the socialist president of Chile, also started out as a great admirer of the fascists. Now, Hitler specifically resonated with Hindus. You see, apart from the ideology, you know, Indian Muslims, of course, liked him because of the anti-Jewish reason, but also because of uh, the fact that he had managed to um, break Sudetenland, a part of Czechoslovakia, off from Czechoslovakia. You see, he had thought that Germans belong in Germany. They shouldn't be you know, united with the Czechs because they are different people. And so Gina thought similarly, Indian Muslims shouldn't be united in one state with the Hindus. They should break away. Okay, well, anyway, um, in India, what played was something else. Uh, Hitler was known as having chosen for his flag. He personally had chosen and designed a swastika flag. Now, if you look a bit more carefully, this swastika flag in uh, Germany was not exactly the Hindu swastika. You see, a swastika normally in India is uh, depicted in a solar color. It's red or orange or yellow, something light. Uh, because it's a solar symbol, it's a symbol of the stars turning around, seemingly turning around the earth. And so that's the image of this turning wheel. Uh, moreover, a swastika in India or anywhere in Asia is normally standing upright. And this is fairly logical because it's a symbol of eternity. It is an eternal cycle that lasts as long as the universe. And so here, this swastika is standing on one angle uneasily. That's probably why the National Socialist system has only lasted for 12 years, because it's, it's quite difficult to stand on one leg forever. Um, okay, but nevertheless, it was some kind of swastika. And so that's something that, that impressed Hindus. Then he was uh, a practicing vegetarianist, vegetarian. And that's true. You see, many things are being said about Hitler, often untrue, but this is true. He was a vegetarian. And it was also said that he observed celibacy. And so this also is something that is naturally honored by Hindus. Even if they don't practice it themselves, nevertheless, they think it's a great thing like uh, about Subhash Chandra Bose, when after the war, it became known that he had had a wife in Austria and a daughter with her. You see, his own followers in India refused to believe it because they thought that such a charismatic man like uh, Subhash Bose could not have spilled his semen on procreation. And so, you see, the similar thought existed about Hitler. And the German propaganda actively uh, made people believe that he was a celibate. In reality, he had had several lovers and ultimately he, he got married. So, um, but that was all kept secret. It's only after the war that people knew about it. And then one other thing they liked about him, and again, this is not something typical for the uh, Hindu nationalists, this is 
typical for Hindus in general, you know, they liked about him that he, he gave the British a hard time. And indeed, the war that he started has greatly contributed to the downfall of the British Empire. He has actively contributed to India's independence, mainly through the opportunities it gave to Subhash Chandra Bose. However, most people had no idea of his specific ideological program, didn't support that program. And that is even true for uh, Hindutva ideologues like Savarkar and Golwalkar. And about Golwalkar, you can check in the book that he wrote at the time. We, our nationhood defined, which is par excellence, the Hindu Nationalist Manifesto. Uh, it is often cited in order to prove that he was a Nazi, whereas if you read the book, it proves exactly the opposite. Now about this, uh, Tanya, I think we have had a discussion before which was videotaped, and that must be among the videos on your channel, right? So there's a, it's, you know, I, Call on everyone to go see it. Um, a talk about Golwalkar's book, We. Uh, so I will not repeat yes, the whole Dr. thing. And I'll just post the link on chat right now yeah. for all our audience members. They can go and view that. Thank you. Right. And I've also given a talk. I Going through my files, I noticed I have a PowerPoint also about what happened to that book afterwards which is a talk I gave at the, um, at the Indus University of Ahmedabad almost five years ago. Uh, but I am, of course, willing to uh, update that here. Now, the idea that fascism essentially is one thing, is uh, a concept that can be used for Nazi Germany and can also be used for uh, rightist uh, parties today. Um, that is not supported by the actual history of those nationalist movements of the interbellum. You see, in 1934, there was a conference in Montreux, in Switzerland, near Geneva, um, of all these nationalist parties. And so they were very psyched about what was happening in Italy. But you see, at the time, of course, communication was not what it was today. Most people didn't know in detail what was happening in other countries, were far more influenced by uh, their own uh, environment. So when they got together, they discovered that they were very different. And so nationalist movements, it's only natural that they are mostly conditioned by their own national circumstances, which are very different between the different, even European countries. So this conference totally flopped. And so they disbanded in, well, a bad mood, you see. Um, and um, so there was no common ground. Um, and so there was no, what scholars call unifascism. Uh, incidentally, to the, I, I haven't been able to get all the details of this conference, but to my knowledge, there was no Hindu nationalist movement in attendance. Um, nevertheless, there was a definitional common ground. In fact, I, I've already had to assume so when I say that an array of nationalist authoritarian parties came together. So there is a definitional common ground, namely nationalism, which may be something different from imperialism. And the fact that they were against what they called bourgeois democracy, bourgeois parliamentarism, uh, and instead favored the leader principle. So in my country, this Verdinazo, they had a leader called Joris von Severen. And I remember my late father, um, he spent the summers in, somewhere in the countryside in a two, three streets away from the summer camp of this movement where they held their trainings. So he had often seen them um, 
marched by and he tended to laugh at them. He was a bit of, he, he was clown-esque, you see, he could make jokes uh, by his physical language. And so he would mock them. And this was not something he did only after the war. You see, at that time too, he was from a very Catholic family. And Catholics didn't like this uh, wave of nationalist movements. Uh, first of all, this nationalism was against the Catholic idea of universalism. The word Catholic means universal. And I, I remember my father was very proud that he could walk into a church in Buenos Aires or in Manila or in Goa, and everywhere he would follow the exact same Eucharist. And so... You see, this idea of nationalism was quite foreign to them. But what was even more foreign was this leader principle. You see, in Catholic terms, the leader principle is a form of idolatry. And, you know, to them, there was only one leader, one infallible leader, which was the Pope, who was the vicar of Christ on earth. And so they didn't like this talk about the leader. So my father would mock this, you know, the, also the body language that they used, you know, to show their enthusiasm for the leader. So that leader principle was, uh, was very common at the time. Um, there is an additional third element, but that's not part of the definition. But it, was, it was not an issue among each of these movements. It was typical for the National Socialist movement and several others, like the Iron Guard in Romania, um, which is a movement that now nobody knows anymore. But so that was something related. And that was anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism, of course, uh, comes from the Christian tradition. Uh, the Jews were always seen as the killers of, of Christ. And um, so that, that tradition spans uh, centuries in all of Europe. Uh, but that acquired a different emphasis after the, um, the discovery of race, of uh, the evolution theory. And so then the supposed evil of the Jews was biologized, it was not just a religious ideology anymore, it was in their genes, supposedly. And so, so anti-Semitism got a far nastier, far more dangerous uh, meaning than it used. But you see that anti-Semitism cannot be considered as an element, uh, a defining element of fascism. Not strictly, though if you give a wide interpretation to fascism as including nationalism, then you may bring it in. So does Hindutva satisfy these criteria? Okay, let's start with those three negations. Remember, anti-communist. Is Hindutva anti-communist? Not really. Communism is anti-Hindutva, that's for sure. But the reverse is only wishy-washy. You see, during the Cold War, the um, Hindu Twa party, the Jan Sang, uh, was not really anti-communist, was not the right, the rightist pole in the Indian political spectrum. There was one uh, anti-communist party, uh, which sided with the American camp in the Cold War, which the John Sang didn't. And uh, that was the Swatantra part. This was founded by uh, uh, Raja Gopalachari, one of the great leaders of the freedom movement. And that's the party for which Sitaram Goel once stood as a candidate for the parliamentary elections. Uh, so that was a real anti communist party. The um, the John Sang flirted with the idea of the third way. Now, we have seen that in another definition of fascism, 
third way is a part of uh, their thinking. Uh, at any rate, uh, the Chan Sang at the time was not rightist in the sense of anti-communist. It saw itself as a third way between uh, Western capitalism and communism. Though they were anti-communist sometimes for nationalist reasons, like when China attacked India, they were anti-China, and because China also happened to be communist, then anti-communism appears frequently in their rhetoric, but generally no. Anti-liberal, you see, are they against liberal democracy? Now, the RSS as such has always insisted that it's not political, so even the question doesn't really apply for them. Uh, they have never objected to a democratic state, never objected to a Westminster democracy that prevailed in India. Uh, though the internal order of the RSS, now that I could not call democratic. Um, there they have a tendency to follow the leader, not because of the fascist leader principle, but rather more because of the ancient Indian idea of the guru. You know, you're not supposed to uh, dissent from what the guru teaches. Uh, you're supposed to obey him. And um, at the same time, in RSS discourse, there is often uh, talk of uh, a political view uh, that is rather democratic. You see, they, they like to emphasize that uh, the way how, how India dealt well, you see, integrated the British given idea of parliamentary democracy. They did it well, whereas Pakistan failed completely. Why? Because in Hinduism, this is natural. Some form of democracy, some form of uh, popular sovereignty already existed. And so they point to the fact that ancient India had republics alongside kingdoms. Uh, the phenomenon of the village panchayat. Panchayat means the, the meeting of five, you know, meeting of a number of caste representatives. You see, within caste society, there was a formula for each caste, including the lowest castes, to advocate their own interests and come to some kind of agreement. Nevertheless, inside the RSS, um, there is a sort of respect for the guru principle. And this sits well with the Hindu mentality, apparently, because I've noticed often and now with the existence of Twitter, you know, you can verify it easily um, because when you speak to people face to face, often they're also a bit inhibited about fully saying what they really think you know, because of reasons of politeness. Whereas on Twitter, most people just let it all hang out. You really get to see what they think. And so what I see there is a lot of devotedness to their leaders, like to Mohan Bhagwat, the leader of the RSS at the moment, but especially uh, for Narendra Modi. You see, there's this, this worship of Narendra Modi. But nevertheless, you know, you can be a democratic voter all while being a devotee of a leader. That's not, I mean, that's, there's no conflict between them. Whereas in, uh, in fascism, of course, this follow the leader principle became the key to the political organization. As for anti-conservative, um, does that fit the RSS? Well, you see the whole Hindu Twa movement from the beginning, mainly thanks to its sources in the Arya Samaj movement, is anti-caste. Now within the um, uh, Hindu Mahasabha when it started, the anti-caste impetus was very strong, was represented by leaders like Swami Shraddhananda. But you see, they already complained that people were joining the party who did not really subscribe to this program. You see, many Hindus 
thought that Hindus should have an organization of their own and were too lazy to found one. So when the Hindu Mahasabha was there, they joined it because it was the only pro-Hindu game in town. But um, they acted like a dead weight against the anti-caste movement. You see, they tried to stop any anti-caste initiatives because they themselves still believed in caste. And so in the in the RSS BJP down to today, that element still uh, exists to some extent. But then it also claims to uphold Hindu culture. Uh, there are some remarks about this, like their uniform is Western, is not traditionally Hindu. They have these brass bands that really are taken from England wholesale. Uh, nothing Hindu about that. But on the whole, you see, they, they espouse, they, they subscribe to traditional Hindu culture. Um, you see, because before we go on, I mean, now we've covered mostly history from before independence. Uh, now we're going to go to the period after independence. Now, there are a few basic facts that you ought to know. And... Um, Nowadays, you see, not people know that much history anymore. So in 1948, the Hindu movement had the wind in the sails because of partition. You see, it had been proven that Mahatma Gandhi and the Congress, in spite of their promises, were not able to stop partition. And then suddenly it lost the wind in the sails because of the murder of the Mahatma. Maybe um, Naturam Godse, who committed the murder, did not sufficiently realize it, but it was an enormous blow that he dealt to his own movement. And in fact, part of the um, caving in of the Hindutva movement till today, before secularism, is ultimately due to this murder and the shame and the doubts that it caused in the Hindu movement. So um, they had to rebuild the whole movement afterwards. And uh, in 1951, they founded a new political party after the Hindu Mahasabha had become unviable because lethally associated with the uh, murder. And so a new political party, the Jan Sang. And there the goal was openly to make India a Hindu Rashtra. Anything that is being written down to today by India watchers and uh, Hindu Twa experts and so on, pretends entirely falsely that the BJP is the same party as the Jansang in 1951. The word Hindu Rashtra, of course, has long been removed from the BJP manifesto. Uh, but in all other respects, too, it's uh, unrecognizable if you look at what the John Sang in the beginning was. But you see, the, um, the rot uh, started already very early. Um, so there was a rebuilding going on and uh, the um, RSS created a lot of daughter or front organizations, uh, a student organization, a trade union, a religious organization, the VHP. And so the political party is one of that family of the Sangh. In 1964, Dine Alupadhyay. Uh, who for a time was also the chairman of the party, uh, launched this doctrine of integral humanism, which is the official party doctrine till today. You see, the, the systematic dishonesty of all the studies about Hindu Dwa, uh, are perfectly illustrated by the fact that most of them never mentioned this official party doctrine. You cannot imagine a book about any political party that fails to mention the doctrine that animates that party. Well, you see, in the case of Hindutva studies, this is the done thing. 
Why? Because integral humanism sounds too innocent. If you want to demonize this party, you can call it nationalist, ultra-nationalist, you know, fascist, fanatic, fundamentalist, and so on. But integral humanism sounds so... I mean, who could be against that? You know, who, 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 who would say, no, I'm an anti-humanist? No, that is unthinkable. So, you see, all those people don't want any positive connotation with this uh, this party. At the same time, the, the left wing of the party, like Nana Deshmukh and the famous Atal Bihari Vajpayee, uh, had this other doctrinal idea, namely what they called Gandhian socialism. Now, Gandhi, the upper Banya, was not a socialist, really. Uh, but anyway, socialist at that time was very much in vogue. So they had to call themselves socialists. And Gandhian at that time also had a rather different connotation from today. Uh, Gandhian was, well, Gandhi counted as the man who had given India freedom. Today, we, we know that the role of Gandhi in achieving independence was not, not that big. Uh, anyway, but so those are the connotations. So we are Indian nationalists. We continue the freedom movement. And at the same time, we are socialists. Uh, so that was very in vogue at the time. And uh, they liquidated all the Hindu content of the party. You see, it was a Hindu nationalist party at the time of Syam Prasad Mukherjee, the founder of the party. But, you know, he died in 1953. And ever since, it's been downhill. So um, they merged into the socialist uh, Janata Party. And then when the party was reconstituted as the BJP in 1980, you see, this was officialized. There was not much Hindu content anymore. It was no more Hindu Rashtra. And systematically, since then, they've been replacing the word Hindu with the word Bharatiya or Indian. Uh, in that uh, founding of the BJP, there was an interesting debate whether the official ideology of the party was going to be integral humanism or Gandhian socialism. And they debated, they had a good time, you know, debating. And ultimately they decided, well, these two are really synonymous. Gandhian socialism, of which there is no manifesto anywhere, you know, can be defined as really the same thing as integral humanism. Now, what they liked about the term integral humanism is that it isn't Hindu. It doesn't say Hindu. You see, in fact, when you study what Dine Alupadia stood for, you could say, well, it is Dharma in a modern formulation, in a secular formulation, but essentially what it comes down to is dharma, is Hinduism. And um, yeah, maybe, maybe not, you see. Maybe that can be said to those Hindus who want to support the party. Yes, keep supporting the party. Yes, keep donating. You know, yeah, we are Hindu to that extent, if that's what you want to believe. But at the same time, the secularists, they could say, oh, no, we are a humanist party. We have nothing to do with Hindus. And so, you see, for the, for the non-Hindu section, the party that came in handy also. And so when Vajpayee came to power briefly in 1996 and then for six years in 1998, uh, this government of his was very un-Hindu. It took no initiatives for Hinduism. Uh, the only exception is by his human resources minister, Murli Manohar Joshi, who tried to rewrite the history textbooks for schools, which was a very clumsy attempt, totally unprepared and so on. But at least he showed where he stood. He was on the pro-Hindu side. Uh, so the party in general was not. But what counts for the present discussion is that it always respected democracy. Like in 1996, after 13 days of government, 
Vajpayee uh, went through a vote of confidence in parliament. He lost with one vote. And you see, I don't know what Hitler would have done in those circumstances. But Vajpayee fully respected democracy. He abdicated. And ever since, you see, the BJP has won elections. He has never abolished elections, which is what a dictator would do. Now, is, uh, is the Hindu movement nationalist? Well, yes, of course it is. Uh, it says so at any rate. Uh, and the word nationalism has a positive connotation in India. You see, it meant the freedom struggle. It meant anti-colonial. It was the alternative for British imperialism. So this is not true in the rest of the world. After 1945, uh, nationalism acquired a negative connotation. And it meant being against human rights for everyone, being against globalism. In India, it mainly means being against separatism. It meant being against partition at the time. And ever since, it means being against Tamil separatism, Naga separatism, Kashmiri separatism, you know, being for uh, unity and integrity of the Indian. Nevertheless, apart from that general and positive meaning, it must be noted that both Savarkar and Golwalkar tried to model their movement on European nationalism. This was in the 20s or 30s, when nationalism still had a positive connotation. And of course, at some point, nationalism had a uh, positive role. There is this Israeli historian, Yoram Hazoni, who uh, has argued that, after all, you have to admit this merit of nationalism, that it brought many people together who earlier had been like foreigners to one another. When people did not know much more than their village or their immediate region, then nationalism lifted them out of this, this confinement and made them dedicated to a larger cause. Like, for instance, the, uh, the German anthem, Deutschland über alles, Germany above everything, is uh, always uh, interpreted by outsiders and because of the experience of the Second World War uh, as meaning Germany above all other nations. Germany is the best. Now, that's not what it means. Germany above everything means Germany above Bavaria, above Prussia, above Rhineland, and so on. You see, the attachment to their local areas, which at that time still had a political dimension, like the Kingdom of Bavaria. Um, you see, that should be superseded and loyalty should be redirected to the whole of uh, Germany. So that's the whole idea of uh, nationalism, to do something about the internal divisions. You see, in Germany, it meant outgrowing the attachment to the local regions. In India, the application in India, you know, is fairly obvious. It means outgrowing the division in castes. And so that also explains the anti-caste uh, element in Goldwalkers, especially Savakar's uh, political uh, activism. It is often uh, thought in the West, at any rate, that the murderer of Mahatma Gandhi was against his supposed anti-caste stand. Now, that's not the case at all. Uh, there have been a number of murder attempts on Mahatma Gandhi, and I think one of them was indeed by some caste fanatic. Now, this was not Naturam Gotse. Naturam Gotse himself had been active in the anti-caste movement. He organized uh, inter-caste uh, dinners. He had been friends already in school with uh, untouchables uh, to the, you know, frowning uh, by his parents. And so, you see, the more you are Hindu nationalist, 
the more you are against caste. I mean, outsiders think, oh, Hinduism equals caste. So if you're a fanatic Hindu, then you are fanatically pro-caste. Well, no, it is just the opposite. Incidentally, nationalism then was so popular that Jinnah, when he tried to justify the separation of the Indian Muslims, he also cast that into nationalist terminology. He said, well, you see the Muslim community, they have their own cuisine, their own dress and so on. They have all the attributes of a separate nation. Now, Hindu Twa and Hinduism are not the same thing. This is said explicitly by uh, Savakar in his booklet uh, Hindu Twa from 1924. So there is a distinction between the Hindu religion, which is colloquially called Hinduism, and the Hindu nation, which is what he terms Hindu Twa. Uh, unfortunately, uh, today this is something that has to be said because most people don't know it. Very many people belonging to the Sang use these terms interchangeably. A lot of times that uh, Hindu to this, Hindu to that, when they clearly mean Hinduism. Like, for instance, about myself, hostile sources like Wikipedia, which has a number of uh, items of pure slander against me, uh, says in this item, in this entry about myself, uh, they say that I have something to do with Hindu Dwa. Well, that's not the case at all. You see, I have never committed myself to Hindu Dwa. I have written a very critical book uh, about the Hindu movement already 25 years ago, and I still stand by it. But I am a friend of the Hindus, and I like Hinduism, which is distinct from Hindu Twa. I'm not an enemy of Hindu Twa. It's just that, well, I don't like it. You see, I think this nationalism was something quite understandable during the time of the freedom movement, when it was necessary to unite the nations and make it independent against British imperialism. But you see, apart from that instrumental role that nationalism could play, I don't think it is uh, something that should be perpetuated. Now, you know, if people call me Hindu Twavadi, they're simply wrong. In fact, according to Savarkar's definition, I don't qualify anyway, because he defines a Hindu as someone who has India as his fatherland and his holy land. Now, I have been on, I don't know, it was pilgrimage, but as some reverential uh, journey to some holy places in India. And so in, you know, with generous exaggeration, you could say, okay, my holy land, India, but it's certainly not my fatherland. It's never going to be. So I'm never going to be a Hindu. Um, nevertheless, not only Wikipedia and such liars uh, associate me with Hindu Twa, so do many Hindu Twa Vadis. Why? Well, because they don't distinguish between Hindu Twa and Hinduism. For them, this is these are synonyms. And they use the term Hindu Twa, applying it to themselves without being aware that this is controversial, that you see this is going to trigger enmity against them. No, they think, uh, you know, Hindu Twa is something like Islam. Uh, it's, it's, it's a religion. Well, okay. Uh, next, religious nationalism. So the beginning goal was uh, Hindu Rastra, the Hindu state. This was a novelty. Um, Shivaji never called his state uh, Hindu Rastra. Uh, though he called it uh, Hindu Pad Pad Shahi, which is Hindu sovereignty. And that's perhaps already close. Um, so after Shyam Prasad Mukherjee's death, this, uh, the, the Hindu political party was progressively de-Hinduized. Down to a, a moment today where uh, 
under Narendra Modi, supposedly a Hindu fanatic, the whole policy of appeasement of the minorities continues, whereas the existing legal discriminations against Hindus simply stay on the statute book, are not abolished. There is not even an intention to abolish them. Um, so we've come to that point. You see, issues that would immediately be tackled by the John Sang, if it had ever come to power, are now just condoned or even worsened by the BJP government. Um, nevertheless, it should also be emphasized that the BJP uh, keeps on attracting activist committed Hindus. And this is important because uh, the disappointing non-Hindu policies of the BJP have led some Hindus to, to complain about this and then to say, oh, we should create a new party. Uh, though nobody has ever been energetic enough to take the initiative. And, and today it would be a lot easier than in the past because of the modern communication technology. Uh, so nobody does that, but they keep on dreaming of it. Uh, so I personally think, you see, this is, you know, given the fun-loving nature of the Hindus, I would say, keep on partying and, you know, stay in your own party and try to solve the problem within your own party. And so it's perfectly possible to create what is called a tendency, an intra-party tendency, a certain ideological movement that tries to steer the party as a whole in the direction it chooses. And so bring back the Hindu spirit within the BJP. Uh, why is that possible? Well, precisely because there are very many committed Hindus inside the BJP, even if not at the top layer. And so even at the, the secondary level, like the state level, you have several chief ministers that show a strong commitment to Hinduism. They are not in a position to change the constitution, but at least within the state, you know, their policies are strongly pro him. Um, so everything remains possible. Um, in the early 90s, I remember a BJP slogan, Hindu India, secular India. That was a slogan in favor of a Hindu India. Because they said, you see, those things that people want to uh, emphasize when they say secular, those things are already present inside Hinduism. Namely, uh, tolerance, pluralism. You see, a spirit of uh, open debate, of free speech, and so on. That's all there in Hinduism. And so the idea that a religious party has to favor the Inquisition or the Jihad or something, that simply doesn't apply to Hinduism. So the element Hindu is still there. Now, today is the opposite. Like Mohan Bhagwat, the RSS leader, says, every Indian is a Hindu. That is historically untrue. You see, the word Hindu, if you care to know, the word Hindu was brought into India by the Islamic invaders. You see, they brought terror and misery and so on to Hindu society. But one rather good thing they brought was the word Hindu. And the word Hindu meant Indian. Initially in Iran and in Arabia, it simply meant India as a geographical term. But once they came into India, they used Hindu with a religious dimension, namely all those Indians who are not us, who are not Muslim. And so the word Hindu from the beginning intrinsically meant not the minorities. No, that, that, that's a dangerous term. You see, if you define Buddhism, Sikhism, and so on as minorities, then those minorities are also Hindu. But um, those religions that, you know, start missioning and 
setting themselves apart as superior and subjecting the Hindus to, to slavery and so on. Um, those are not Hindu by definition. And so to say every Indian is a Hindu, no, nonsense. You know, that's saying, you know, black is white. Um, so it's simply not true. And anyway, what does it mean today? It means um, crawling before secular nationalism. You see, divesting Hindu nationalism of its Hindu content. Um, and so if you're going to be simply nationalist, you might as well join Congress. They claim that they're nationalists. Uh, okay, next. Uh, is the Hindu Twa movement anti-democratic? Well, this has simply never been an issue. You see, the RSS, even though not too democratic in its own internal functioning, never wanted to impose on India a non-democratic system. And so it accepted Westminster democracy uh, on the idea that even though that system in its details didn't exist in India, by and large, the whole idea of a give and take of checks and balances and so on, that very much uh, existed in Hindu history. Uh, they also like to refer to the Janapadas, the, the republics in ancient India, and so on, or the fact that uh, the, the Chakravarti, the one who established an empire, uh, had to uh, recognize the, uh, the Swatantra of the different units in his empire. You know, the idea was that he would invite and otherwise force neighboring kings to pay tribute but otherwise he had to recognize their internal autonomy they would still have their own customs their own laws and so on and so that always existed in hinduism you know this idea of uh, of oppression was just not there um so the BJP also in practice has never infringed on democracy, certainly never more than any other party in India, um, except for Congress, which has imposed the emergency dictatorship for a few years, which BJP people like LK Adrani, for example, actively opposed. Uh, I also gave the example of uh, Vajpayee, who abdicated immediately when he lost the confidence vote by a single vote. Um, and so this is largely uh, acknowledged by all the critics because uh, rather than simply calling uh, Narendra Modi a dictator or something, which he clearly isn't, he's simply the winner of successive elections which is something else. Uh, so they resort to uh, wishy-washy terms that recognize this democratic mindset and yet try to blacken. Like, for instance, they call it electoral dictatorship. So they admit that he has won the democratic procedure of election and nevertheless, somehow it should have to be a dictatorship. Uh, which, you know, I mean, given that all the newspapers and so on keep on criticizing Modi and there's no crackdown on them, they're not imprisoned and so on, you know, all the, you know, uh, the, the, the freedom of speech simply continues. You know, there are no uh, anti democratic measures against them, but still they want to call it a dictatorship albeit an electoral dictatorship. Or another term is uh, one by Christophe Jaffrelo is ethnic democracy, uh, meaning that the, this ethnic thing means Hinduism. And as you know, Savarkar has redefined Hindus as a nation rather than as a religion. So you could use the term ethnic. So this is supposed to be a Hindu democracy rather than just a democracy. The way that Israel is a Jewish republic rather than simply any republic.
but so that's that's how far they can go. They can't go farther, you see. If you ask for evidence, they'll be very hard pressed to establish that this is a fascist uh, party. You see, in some so-called fascist movements, namely in National Socialism, there's also the element of anti-Semitism. Now, it so happens that in the two main founding texts of uh, Hindutva, namely Hindutva itself by Savarkar and we by Golwalkar, that they explicitly support Jewish nationalism and the Zionist cause. And indeed, you see, sometimes in political papers, Hindutva is described as the Hindu equivalent of Zionism. And pro-Zionism has remained a constant in the BJP's policy. Congress was always strongly pro-Palestinian and refused to have diplomatic relations with Israel until 1991, when Nara Singh Harao, the best prime minister that India ever had, um, joined, uh, I mean, added uh, the recognition of Israel, the uh, opening of diplomatic ties with Israel to his other laudable measures like the liberalization of the economy. Now, Hindus do attract the suspicion of anti-Semitism foolishly by using the term Semitic or Abrahamic when they mean not the Jews. They've never had any quarrel with the Jews and today the Jews are also simply not a factor in Indian political life. When they mean the Christians and the Muslims. And so, um, so I find this terminology very uh, unfortunate, if only because it's simply incorrect. You see, Semitic is, a, well, originally it meant the descendants of Sem, who is one of the three sons of Noah. Um, but so it has come to mean in the 18th or so century, the family of languages that includes Hebrew and Arabic. Um, now, that's a very unfortunate name. You see, uh, before Moses, the Israelites and the Phoenicians and the Arabs and the, the Ugaritics and so on, they practiced polytheistic religions, pagan religions. And so they are the enemies of, uh, of Islam, you see. Uh, the religion of uh, Canaan, what is now uh, Israel and Lebanon, uh, practiced shirk. Shirk means to associate a special, remarkable human being with a star. You see, to make him divine. After after famous, you know, king dies, then he's put in heaven, and he's being worshipped. Now, this shirk is the Islamic term for the biggest possible sin, namely associating a creature with the creator. Um, so what was normal in these Semitic cultures is the biggest sin in Islam. So to term, to, to, term and to, to, to call Islam Semitic is uh, very confusing. Um, the term Abrahamic similarly is very unfortunate. Uh, the Jews see themselves as the descendants of Abraham, Abraham the first Jew. Uh, to link him with Christianity is meaningless. Christianity divorces itself from the, uh, the Judaic lineage. Uh, it's a religion for the Greeks, for the pagans. Um, and then Islam, of course, uh, loves to see itself as uh, springing from uh, Ishmael, the eldest son of Abraham. But you see, this is just a story. And in the Bible, the only source we have about Ishmael 
he or his mother comes from Egypt. And so after she separates from Abraham, she goes back to Egypt with her son. You know, Arabia is not in the picture at all. Uh, so I, I frown upon these terms. And anyway, they have the unfortunate effect that they create a completely false impression of anti-Semitism. Uh, so this is a mistake, both a mistake on the part of outsiders who assume it has something to do with anti-Semitism, but it's also a mistake on the part of the Hindus who are not sufficiently self-critical to realize that they are mistakenly using these terms. So in every phase of the history of Hinduism, um, there is no conflict with the Jewish community in India. Um, and anyway, uh, that, that would have been very strange because Hindus have never really cared about the religion of others that were welcome to settle in India. You see, there were Syrian Christians who came. They were allowed to settle. There were no questions asked about what is your religion really about. The Moplas settled, Arab traders in Kerala. First, they were pagans. Then when in Arabia, Islam came into vogue, more and more of them were Muslims. And neither before nor after did Hindus ask them, hey, first tell us what it is that you're doing in those mosques, otherwise you can't be allowed in. No, they gave them hospitality like that. The Parsis, same story. And so this also counts for the Jews. Um, so, yes, there are theological differences between Hinduism and Judaism, but these have never come in the way of good, normal human relations. Other elements are uh, taken from the definitions that I've given before. Well, in genetic. Now, this means that you try to revive something from the past to bring it back. You see, this Pauline is uh, in India, uh, Puna, like Punar Janma, um, a new. So, this is somewhat true in the sense that Hindu revivalists usually think of reviving some kind of golden age. Though this notion of golden age is also often misinterpreted. You see, India under the Guptas was a golden age in this elementary sense that India at the time was independent. It was not occupied by Muslims. It was not occupied by the Portuguese or the British. It was independent. And so if you're suffering a foreign yoke, then mere independence regardless of what it brings in material culture and so on, mere independence is indeed a golden age. And then otherwise, you see, what is wrong with bringing back elements from the past? You see, in, in, in the past, for example, India was very creative in science, played a pioneer role in, in astronomy and mathematics, in city building and so on. And what's wrong with that? And so after a rather, you know, a time of, of oppression and so on, that was not so flourishing, now this is coming back. And indeed, we see it coming back. After independence, some of it came back. Now under Modi, more of it comes back. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing fascist about it. The idea of national restoration in the face of humiliation, well, that is very literally applicable. You see, in the 1920s, when these movements started, India was being humiliated. And so they wanted to do something about it. Again, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, to forge social rebirth based on a holistic, national, radical third way. Now, that is correct. Uh, this um, integral humanism saw itself as a third way as, you know, a, a way in between the excesses of socialism, as was demonstrated at the time in the Soviet Union and in China. 
and of uh, materialist consumerism as demonstrated at the time in the West. Uh, so you see, again, that's not fascist. You see, maybe fascism also likes to see itself as the third way, but that doesn't mean that you can define anybody, you know, talking about the third way as fascist. Then the cult of the leader, you know, again, you see, this has no political meaning. There is no idea of you have to follow the leader as your political leader. Though there is a certain mentality of extolling leader figures, uh, mostly in the spiritual field, but sometimes also in the political field. But again, you see, if people democratically elect Narendra Modi, it is nobody's business that they also happen to have a strong emotional feeling for Narendra Modi. You know, again, that's not fascism. So to conclude, the um, inspiration of the Hindu movement mostly comes from Hindu tradition. Like, uh, they like to think of uh, what was then called an empire, what nowadays you would rather call a confederacy under a president rather than an empire under an emperor, the Chakravarti Kshetra, which has autonomy, which has a, a Swatantra, a Swadharma for all its constituent provinces. The notion of Dharma being dutiful, the Janapadas or republics, India today could be called the Janapada. Um, the idea of the Panchayat, the village council, where the different communities met on an equal footing. And then Indian history with figures like Chanakya or like Shivaji. So that's their main inspiration. Um, any, any, RSS activist you talk to will be able to tell you all about Chanakya or Shivaji. He will have, he may know the name Hitler. He probably won't know the name Mussolini. Uh, so that's a, a very peripheral thing. In fact, the whole idea of uh, the input from the West, which was a bit inevitable during the British period, um, is, is very limited, is very peripheral. And what much is there is mainly the influence of nationalism as uh, it was demonstrated during Italy's unification movement in the 1860s. So that's what uh, Savarkar popularized when he translated the political manifesto of Giuseppe Mazzini. Um, otherwise, there's really not much uh, of this uh, Western influence. For inspiration from the Axis powers, it was simply too late. The Hindu movement already existed. You see many observers with an agenda say, ah, no, you see the, uh, the Hindu movement was based on the, uh, on the Axis powers. That's simply not true. Um, they did listen to what they heard. I mean, at the time, people looked up to Europe. And so they were interested in what these had to offer regarding nationalism. Um, however, they did not show any sign of following them regarding anti-democracy, let alone the idea of persecution of minorities. Um, so they were perfectly ready to live in a country with minorities. Um, then that Hindu Twa adopted anti-Semitism is too ridiculous to, uh, to elaborate further. Um, so you see, there was no axis orientation the way there was, for instance, in Subhash Chandra Bose who was a Congress leftist. Um, and, you know, at the time, of course, there were strategic alliances 
like the one that uh, that Subhai's boss uh, contracted. Um, but it's a thing of the past. It was part of those circumstances. After 1945, this was all over. And in fact, you see, that's one of the that's one of the inspiring things about India. You see, in Europe, in some countries like my own, the um, the the enmities that existed in the Second World War between collaborators and resistors and so on still have ramifications down to today. Whereas in India, exactly the opposite happened. You see, a, a feeling was created after 1945. Oh, now we're all together. Um, it was said, for example, that the communists and Ambedkar and the Muslim League, that all together, you see, with Congress, they had fought for independence. This was not true at all. Uh, the communists at the time had, had heavily collaborated with the British, even betraying independence activists, like in the Quit India movement. The Muslim League had always collaborated with the British, you know, hoped to gain as much as possible in negotiations with the British. Uh, but precisely in its mendaciousness, this argument that all Indians had stood together for independence meant that the enmities of the past years were deemed over. You see, in India, the Second World War in 1945 was really ended. And so the, the enmities of the past were buried. And so they left this whole, this nightmare, in fact, behind. That's one of the great things about India. You see, it started anew. And with a wiser leadership than it received in the first years of independence, you know, it would have made an enormous jump forward. Uh, that was not so sensational, let's say, under Nehru. Uh, but at any rate, you see, this, this misery of the confrontation between imperialist Britain and Nazi Germany and, and Japan, uh, that was over. That was totally, you know, the Indians left that behind. They uh, chose to start a uh, life of their own as a nation. Thank you. Good afternoon. I just wanted to ask you something about the last, uh, the conclusion that you made that uh, India left it all behind. To me, it seems as if it's only a section that forgot all about it, namely the Hindus, who forgot about all these things. And uh, it's probably a combination of intellectual laziness and negationism. It's not a true reconciliation. Uh, that's what I feel. I mean, what, what yeah. is your opinion on that? Well, let's say that the uh, other parties started a different struggle, or in the case of Islam, revived their ancient jihad. You see, I mean, the, the, the Pakistan movement took place under very specific circumstances, like that they defined themselves as a nation was something exceptional in Islamic history. They frown on uh, nationalism. So, you know, they had to swallow that, but you know, they quickly resumed the old story, you know, the, the problem that Islam has always posed. Um, the communists similarly uh, found themselves after 1945 in quite new situations um, with uh, the Soviet victory, then China turning communist. Um, all they knew, of course, is that they remained hostile to Hinduism. Um, so yeah, you, you have a point that it's, it's mainly the Hindus who forget. And, you know, not only that conflict, you know, that's something that they generally do. You see, Hindus are very fun loving and they don't like to be troubled with problematic issues. That is a, a constant that certainly is still true today. Uh, you must also consider that in the early years, 
the communists took over a lot of education and they airbrushed a lot of communist history plus the soviet union was practically the only superpower who could do anything for india as a country so all these things i think contributed in the common mind to say that you know these people were not all that bad and the uh, soviet union is great and therefore yeah but you see the example of the alliance with the soviet union explains a lot about the uh, positive relation with uh, italy or with japan um in the sense that well people make the alliances that that serve their interests best you see if um, bs munje took inspiration uh from what he saw of military organization in italy well okay you know if he had visited the soviet union he certainly would have taken inspiration from whatever military uh organization he saw there because that's something they had to offer and that hindus at that time completely lacked but you know this you know, this doesn't mean that they have to take over everything that they saw in italy which indeed they didn't and so the alliance of the soviet union could often be something very very unnatural for example sitaram goel the most prominent anti communist in india uh made it a point to stipulate you see when criticizing indira gandhi that uh this was not meant to undermine the alliance that india had built with the soviet union and so this was written not long after the bangladesh war when america would have intervened on the side of pakistan were it not for the soviet warning that this could become bigger than the subcontinent and so you see even even sitaram goel as an undoubted anti communist saw the merit of allying themselves or of allying india with the main communist superpower at the time and so similarly subhas bose could ally with japan without thereby condoning all the atrocities and so on that japan was committing at the time uh, you know you have to distinguish these things you know there are people who always like to uh, use every link they can find in order to incriminate someone and like for instance uh, when when modi unveiled the statue of subhash chandra bose immediately she published an old photograph of subhas bose shaking hands with adolf hitler well you see the defining trait of scholars is precisely that they can distinguish you know what subhas bose did for india cannot be summed up in that handshake not at all you see that handshake is one move he had to make in his whole policy of establishing some kind of uh military support from the axis that would serve the thing he really had in mind namely independence for india uh so i mean it's not so difficult you know to, you have to distinguish things you don't have to uh confuse them all together and then you get a far better understanding of what really happened is that an answer to your question yeah i mean because i think most indians also saw the soviet union very favorably during that time yeah because it was the only uh, bulwark against uh, the us and its yeah. interest in uh, pakistan and so on. so yeah, yeah. and uh, it's kind of interesting that you should mention uh, shri sitaram goel because some of his writings and maybe perhaps that of all ramsroop also they often use the word semitic yeah on occasion yeah i, I think it is my idea that you know in india people are still you uh, stuck to the old usage of the word uh, semitic in relation to religions as whereas the rest of the world has moved on yeah the same thing with nationalism <laughs> okay yeah it's true i mean i think it's unfortunate and so that use of the word semitic is something i try to change but 
you know, I realized that my voice doesn't carry far enough to to really change it. Maybe mm -hmm. next generation, I don't know. Yes, but uh, interestingly, in uh, uh, Sitaram Goel's own works, he yep. uh, not only he at sometimes he calls it Semitic religions, but sometimes he says that I don't want to call uh, Christianity and Islam as Semitic, but as biblical religions. And he okay. says that the Semites were actually polytheists. Yep. He also makes the distinction. I mean, I don't know which came before the other, but you know, both of these versions are to be found in their works. Yeah, you see, to um, to evaluate uh, Judaism from uh, a Hindu viewpoint, you have to see several problematic and several positive things. Um, you know, it's undeniable that their stricture against uh, idolatry uh, started with Moses, um, with no one else. I don't think that the first known monotheist, namely the Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten, that he started destroying idols for Amon or Osiris or Ra or so, not that I'm aware of. Uh, whereas Moses starts it, in fact, with the destruction of the golden calf, just after receiving the Ten Commandments. Um, so that is there. Only, you see, that practice of iconoclasm went over on Christianity and especially Islam. But in Judaism, it didn't continue. Why? You see, this, this uh, iconoclasm was directed against idolatry by fellow Jews. And so once the, the whole Jewish people had become monotheist, there were no idols to destroy anymore. You see, they didn't interfere with the religion of others. And that's what counts for Hindus. You see, they don't care to know what Judaism is all about. You see, if it is anti-idolatry and so on, well, they don't care. You see, the Jews do what they want in their synagogues. You know, from a Hindu position, you see, this question simply doesn't arise. As long as they leave us alone, and they certainly do, then it's all right for Hindus. Whereas that which uh, Christianity and Islam do, now that, of course, they certainly meddle in Hinduism. They try to destroy Hinduism, which Judaism never did. And so uh, it's, it's very correct that there are friendly relations uh, with Jews far more than with Muslims or Christians. Because the thing that counts is not what you believe internally, uh, but is how you treat one another. And so there Jews don't pose a problem, whereas Muslims and Christians do. So to get back to the issue of fascism, how is it that, uh, you know, you say that academics are supposed to understand the minutiae of things and so on. Uh, how is it that all these Western academics who presumably have nothing material to gain from India or, uh, I mean, India's losses, why is it that they have consistently maintained this tradition of wrong definition and wrong characterization or are there, are there native informants feeding them the wrong thing which is getting recycled? What is the situation there? Well, I, I think... The whole explanation is what native informants tell them. You see, originally there was nothing specifically anti-Hindu about the left. You see, Karl Marx, of course, disparaged Hinduism. But you see, he didn't see it as an enemy. He saw it as something, well, you see, something rustic that, you know, wouldn't survive modernization. Um, and... You see, later on, also because of the Cold War situation, uh, Hindus were relatively the good guys precisely because of this, um, this earlier discussed uh, relation with the Soviet Union. And anyway, they had other things to do. You see, they had a class struggle to wage in which India didn't particularly figure, uh, except for maybe the poor against the rich. You know, that, that's language that Marxists understand. 
Um, but you see the current wave of Hindu hatred, you know, that does not have its source in leftist ideology. Um, that has been kindled precisely by these native informants. You see, what has happened the last decades is the, this uh, very large scale migration of Indians to the West. And so they, uh, they populate uh, the, the, the relevant departments and universities. Um, often they themselves bring, bring original things to, um, to Western leftism. Like for instance, this Gayatri Spivak is one of the leading lights of postmodernism. And so she contributed a lot to that. Um, so you see there's an Indian leftism and the role that they play inside Western leftism is in itself a very interesting topic. But so one thing they did was to um, mobilize the Western left against India. You see, the Western left before that didn't care very much. And, you know, indeed, some, some of the left even, well, were close to or sympathized with the, the cultural pro-India wave in the 60s and 70s. And so at that time, India was quite popular. And so this changed in the 90s, especially. Uh, I've seen it with my own eyes, um, how people who ought to have been very pro-Hindu, or at least sympathetic to Hinduism, turned anti-Hindu. And um, so this is partly because of the influence of the Indian left, partly also a revival, but that in itself also under influence of Indians, uh, of the awareness of caste. You see, this is something that uh, for a century or so already is common in the West, that Hinduism is associated with caste. And, you know, in, I remember in our classes of Catholic religion, we had some lessons devoted to Mahatma Gandhi. And of course, he was always praised as a saint and an, an almost Christian. And then especially what was highlighted was his own struggle against caste. Um, and so then you see caste was, was planted firmly in everybody's consciousness as the bane of Hinduism, as something that is obviously evil and that we have to struggle against. Now, if you define caste as a kind of racial oppression, even racial slavery, although caste is not at all slavery. But uh, you see many people in the West with only a hazy knowledge will say it's racial slavery. You see that kindles in them the desire or the, the feeling of a duty to, to eradicate it. And uh, you can see this within Western history. Uh, first you had uh, people forgot about slavery because in the seventh century, some Frankish queen um, abolished slavery among Christians. They could still take slaves among pagans. That's why you have the word slave. It means Slav. The Slavic population at that time were still pagan and they were neighbors of a Christianized Western and Southern Europe. So they par excellence were were, were hunted down as slaves. Um, but at least among Christians, slavery disappeared. Then the next phase is that slavery reappeared uh, when this transatlantic slave trade started. And the next phase is that uh, because of the enlightenment ideas, the French Revolution uh, abolished slavery. And then more and more circles started to be against slavery. And even though the Bible uh, has always condoned slavery, nevertheless, under the influence of these new enlightened ideas, some Christians, not all of them, by no means all of them, but some Christians started campaigning against slavery. And this included uh, a leading Christian campaigner in, in, in England, which was then the 
major superpower, uh, William Wilberforce. And so he managed to get slavery outlawed. And then you see England started to use its might not to take slaves, but to free slaves and to force other countries to abolish slavery, including even the Ottoman Empire, including the Mughal Empire, of course. Um, so, so this is rather present in the European consciousness, like you see it now. Now that you have all this woke talk about decolonize and so on, you have stuff about slavery, we have to pay reparations for slavery and so on. So in that debate, many people also throw up the fact that, yes, for a few centuries we have been guilty of slavery, but we also have the merit of abolishing slavery, which is rather rare in history. You see, practicing slavery is far, far, far more common than abolishing slavery. And so, because of this, this necessary memory of our struggle against slavery, you see, you get the idea, oh, we have to continue the fight against slavery, against racial slavery, Aryans against Aboriginals. We have to continue that fight until it's really eradicated. And where do you still find racial slavery? Abba, in India, of course. Because you see, many people are not very well aware of the state of caste in India today. Uh, they think that this is a caste society. Well, this is an anti-caste society. The laws favor the low castes. There are reservations for low castes. Um, and among the upper castes, already since the days of Mahatma Gandhi, there is an increasing uh, commitment, it's certainly not all over the place yet, but an increasing feeling that, you know, this is over, this is a thing of the past. We have to gradually, without too much trouble, but gradually outgrow this. And so there are more and more intercaste marriages and, and so on and so on. So this is, this is what is happening. Nevertheless, many in the West still think that, you see, caste is all over the place here, and the Hindus are in favor of caste and supporting it and perpetuating it. So we have to step in to eradicate it. And so, you see, this, this whole uh, Hindu hatred that is, that is uh, so much uh, highlighted these days uh, can take place because of this, uh, this soil of uh, this anti-caste feeling. Uh, so this was there all the time already. But you see, now it is Indians living in the West who are uh, making something of it. Like, for instance, in America now, uh, codes in universities that prohibit discrimination against race and gender and so on, now also include the category caste. And so they are trying to make caste an issue in a society where it doesn't exist and in a community, the Hindus, that also haven't brought caste with them. And this, of course, is to different extents, like, for instance, in, in Holland, where you have a community of about 150,000 Hindus who came from Suriname, where they had come as indentured laborers in the 19th century. You see, that community has no caste anymore, yet they are very much Hindu. You see, there, there, there is a community from the Bhojpur area, they speak Bhojpuri Hindi. And the, the, the center of their religiosity really is the Ram Charitmanas of uh, Tulsi Das, or some of them are also with the Arya Samaj. That's also a strong influence. And so they really showcase a modernized form of Hinduism. Like, for instance, generally, uh, the girls get the same kind of Vedic education that, that their brothers get. Um, so it shows that you see Hinduism in a modern, in a, in a rather egalitarian form is perfectly possible. And so what is happening right now in America is, is a, is a step back, which is really fostered not by Western leftists, but by all the Indian expatriates that, uh, 
are now getting ever more influential there. 